this video is intended as a quick review for, of the important vocabulary terms and information that I introduced to my high school students. Um, if you're interested, there will be a link to this document that I made in the video description. Just check that out there. So to begin with, um, students, you will remember that clay comes from the earth. The clay that we're using is dug from the earth and it is natural. It is blended to make very specific clay bodies. Um, and the clay is always divided into groupings, basically three major groupings, based upon their final firing temperature or the property of vitrification. The first grouping that we're talking about is earthenware. Now, earthenware is always low fire, and what we are using is red earthenware, although it can be other colors as well. Our red earthenware that we use at school is a grogless earthenware, which means that we can sponge it. When it fires, it turns an orangish red color. Again, that is low fire. It stays porous after firing. The second grouping is stoneware. Now, stoneware matures at a higher temperature. It actually can become vitrified as opposed to earthenware where it doesn't fully become vitrified. Stoneware can become vitrified um, in mid to high fire range. We have a mid fire stoneware. This is a brown stoneware that we use at school and it does have grog in it. So you have to be aware that you cannot sponge this one uh, when you're cleaning it or you will have a groggy surface. Stoneware again, it can be many different colors. This one ends up by firing a nice tan. Now the third grouping of clay, this is porcelain. Porcelain is not one that we would typically use at school because it is harder to work with. It's not as plastic. It is um, known for its delicate and refined uh, work that you can make with it. It sometimes has a translucent quality. Porcelain is always white. And I, I do occasionally have uh, some that some of the upper levels can try. But typically we just use earthenware and stoneware at our school. And then here you can see the three different clays, earthenware, stoneware, porcelain. And again, you could have uh, clay of different colors, but it's the vitrification that divides it into the categories. Next up is about firing the clay and heating it in the kilns. So the kiln is the chamber in which you heat the pots to be fired. In our kiln room at school, my kilns are all electric. You can see in the walls of the kiln, those are little electric coils that are in the walls of the kiln. They heat up and they heat up everything that's inside of it, the pots, the shelves, everything. The shelves are stacked on kiln furniture on posts, which uh, support them. And then it has a lid that comes down and my Kilns are operated by electricity and they have computerized panels. The general rule of thumb that I tell my students is it takes around 12 hours to fire a kiln and about 12 hours to cool. So it's always going to be at least a 24 hour turnaround depending on how full the load is. Next up is pyrometric cone. So you can see from parentheses there, it says heat or fire and measurer. So pyro, the root coming from the heat or fire, and then metric is to measure. It measures the amount of heat work done in a kiln. A pyrometric cone is a physical little cone made of a specially formulated clay body that is designed to melt or bend at a specific temperature. So this particular cone that I'm holding in my hand is cone 05, which is designed to melt around 1880 degrees. That's one of the temperatures that we use for our earthenware glaze firings. So Cones um, will always be stamped with the very particular um, rating of, of the cone that it, it will fire at. And you can see from the diagram on the paper that when a cone will sit, um, and it sits in a little thing, it's called a cone pack, 
um, when it sits, it actually leans a little bit to one side. That enables the cone to fall in a particular direction, as you can see from the little diagram. So you put three cones of three different temperatures uh, next to one another. The first cone, the one that would be shown on the left, the guide cone is always a cooler temperature than what you want to fire to, and that one will fall first, as shown in the lower diagram. The firing cone, the target temperature, is the one in the middle, and that one should fall so it just bends and the tip of it just tips the cone back. And then the last one, the one that is shown on the right, that is referred to as the guard cone, and that is one a cone hotter than your target cone. So that one should stay standing up straight. And also, by the way, if you ever see a little small triangle symbol sometimes before uh, a cone, it, it might say triangle symbol cone 04. Uh, the triangle symbol is uh, meaning cone. So if you see that on a glaze label, I wanted you to know what that, what that entails. So I have here an example of this is a pre firing of a cone pack. You can see I have cones five, six, seven. So my target cone is cone six. That is for a stoneware glaze. And they just happen to be made of uh, different colors. But when they fire, they actually end up by firing completely white. Their color goes out of them. So you can see that my target cone, the one in the middle there, the tip has just gone down and would just touch. But the uh, the guard cone is still standing up straight, so the cone 7 is still standing. Next up is the small chart of some of the most commonly fired cones that we use here at the high school. So starting with the hottest ones, that would be cone 6 and cone 5. You can see their temperatures above uh, 21 and 2200. That is used only for our mid-fire stoneware glazes. Then cone 04, the key on that one is all clays will bisque fire to that. I fire all my clay bodies regardless if it's earthenware or stoneware to cone 04. And then cone 05, which is 1880, that is for low fire glaze only. That's for earthenware, our red earthenware we use. And then cone 018 is sometimes a specialty one used as an overglaze, a luster overglaze. And next up are the states of clay. The first state of clay is going to be greenware. All unfired clay is known as greenware. And within greenware, we have different stages. The first stage is plastic. That's when it's soft and workable and bendable. And plastic is the common building stage. Leather hard is next. That's when it becomes stiff, but yet workable. It's like the consistency of cheddar cheese. So it's not super flexible. It holds together, but it's still workable. You can add things. And then the third stage of greenware is bone dry. That's when all the water of plasticity is gone. It is cool to the touch and it is ready to be bisque fired. The next stage is bisqueware. After it has been fired once, it's referred to as bisqueware, and then we glaze our bisqueware. Next are the three properties that a usable clay must possess. The first one is plasticity, and plasticity is clay has to have the ability to be worked and resist cracking. The second property, which is in the drying stage, is clay has to have the porosity to dry without cracking. Now porosity can be increased by the addition of grog to a clay body, like this stoneware body has grog in it, that increases porosity. And then vitrification is the third property, that is the ability of clay to become glass-like. That herp happens during the firing, and it only really happens with our stoneware during the glaze firing. The earthenware never actually gets vitrified because it stays porous. All right, now on to our general vocabulary words. Air bubbles or trapped air can cause difficulties with a piece. Um, if you're throwing on the wheel, air bubbles will throw your piece off center because you would have an uneven air bubble in the wall. But more importantly, if you have trapped air in a piece and it's getting fired, it has to be fired extremely slowly to make sure that the water vapor is out. One of the things that I always have my students do is if they do have a trapped air pocket, to vent it with a single vent 
hole, like a needle tool, to allow the water vapor that's in that little air pocket to escape so it doesn't blow up in the kiln because water vapor will make it blow up. Coils are one of the methods of hand building when we roll out coils, and it can be used in conjunction with any other method. Glazes, of course, are typically added after bisque firing, but we can use underglazes before firing. Now, grog, again, are bits of fired clay that are found within some clay bodies to add porosity and strength. And now I'm on the back page. Hand building is working with clay in ways other than on the potter's wheel. So pinch, coil, slab, and also extruder are all methods of hand building. If you take ceramics too, you might have the opportunity to use the extruder. This is basically a large coil maker. Um, next word are paddles, and paddles, of course, are used to sometimes alter in shape uh, a form as you build it. Pinch, of course, is what we did on our pinch cups. It's when you take a ball of clay and you pinch it. Potter's wheels are located in the back of a room. Um, the pug mills, although we're not really using them this year, the pug mills are used in order to recycle clay. When we don't have COVID going on, we'll be using them again. Since we're not really using community clay at this point and you all are keeping and maintaining your own clay supply, that's why we're really not using them. But the stoneware pug mill is for the stoneware and then there's a separate one for the earthenware. That is how I will mix up any old scrap clay, like if I have a bucket of bone dry clay, maybe some dry projects, I can put them in there, fill the pug mill with dry clay, add uh, maybe three quarters of a gallon of water, mix it up for 45 minutes, and it will come out beautiful plastic clay again. So they're a wonderful recycling machine, saves me a lot of money to recycle the clay throughout the year. Next up are ribs, and you all have experience with these. We have ribs of different uh, densities. Uh, some are harder, some are softer, some are notched. Uh, scoring is our next word. Remember that scoring is roughening up of the clay surface when you're joining things. You can use various things to score with. You can use the scoring tools I made, the little scoring rib, or the little scratch wire brush that is in the community tool bins. Next is shrinking. Remember that as clay loses its moisture, its water leaves, it will always shrink and become smaller. It also will shrink during a high fire glaze firing as it changes a little bit more. Next is similar moisture content. Remember that clay should always be of similar moisture content when you attach pieces so they don't crack. Next is slab. Now in ceramics one, we do slabs in a couple, couple different ways. We do little plates, we do little slab forms. That's rolling it out flat. Uh, slip is the next one. Slip is basically just watered down clay. And you can um, prepare slip in advance. Like I sometimes have a couple of squeezy bottles in my class. I put plastic over the top so the slip doesn't dry out on the inside, but that's used for slip trailing. Um, next is Sureform when, or Shredders. Um, the Shredder is just the name of the mud tools and I have a variety of sizes and shapes. We've used them for other things. Next is Turntables, also known as Banding Wheels. Those are to put your projects on. And then we have wear boards. Wear just means pots or pottery, and the wear boards and the wear carts are in the classroom. That's uh, what we can transport our pots on. Next is water vapor, and water vapor is terrible when firing a pot. The pot has to be absolutely dry because if it gets to 212 degrees and it has water vapor in it, Water vapor turn, turns to steam and it will become explosive. So always make sure your pots are thoroughly dry. Keep the walls um, maximum of three quarters of an inch thick so it can dry out a little bit better. If you have really thick areas like at your base, uh, it could pose problems uh, with trapped water vapor. And our last word, wedging, is when we are mixing and combining the clay by pushing it and rotating it into itself. And the wedging is what helps to combine scrap clay to make sure that it is of an even moisture as we are working.